All right, we have the top of the hour here, two o'clock Eastern time at Rochester, New York. And I think it's time to begin this week's Future Trends Forum. Welcome everybody. Welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, chief cat herder for the next hour of conversation. And I'm really grateful to see all of you here today. Today is an unusual program in that we're doing one of our two level synthetic sessions. That is we have right now, 23 people online, and we have uh, close to that number here in person here at the Open Work Conference. So those of you who are coming in, trying to be all quiet, if you could just applaud or shout and say hello. Yeah. I'm glad of all of you being here today. And if this all looks strange, you're not sure what's going on, don't worry, I'll explain it all. And for the 23 of you who are here online, welcome if you're new and welcome if you're not new. I'm glad to see all of you. We have a terrific guest this week, and we have a great program that is brand new that almost nobody knows about. So this is your chance to learn. Ever since the beginning of the forum in 2016, we've been thinking about how to rethink, redesign, and improve higher education. There have been a lot of projects, a lot of efforts, some businesses, some nonprofits, and today we have something really, really new. We have the Paradigm Project. This is a brand new effort that's based in Elon University, but is really a national effort. It's led by wonderful faculty member, leader, scholar, organizer, and great thinker, David Scobie. Uh, he's the director of the Bringing Theory to Practice, and he's the founding director of the Paradigm Project. He's a wonderful person, and instead of talking about him and how cool he is, I'm actually gonna bring him up on stage. And that should be done with just a quick click. Greetings, David. Hey, Brian, thank you for the kind words. And I speak as a proud subscriber to your Patreon. Well, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for the, your kind words and thank you for supporting us. Uh, just a quick show in the audience. Can everybody hear us okay? All right, I mean, I'm a native New Yorker, so I can be as loud as I want, you know, just let me know. Um, and I will keep bringing together what you'd like to share. Now, if you can't get into Shindig right now, but you don't want to speak out loud, We'll have a mic in just a few minutes. And you'd like to talk to us on Twitter, please just use the hashtag FTTE, or you can tweet it myself, I'm Brian Alexander. And we check in Twitter throughout. Uh, David, you know, we like to ask people to introduce themselves in the forum in a peculiar way. We like to ask what you're gonna be working on for the next year. And in so answering that, you'll also be introducing the Paradigm Project. So I guess now is your chance to tell us, what does the next year of SCOBY look like and what does the next year of Paradigm look like? So the next year of my life will be helping to, to lead and organize the Paradigm Project, which we see as a seven-year project, um, as you said, based here at Elon, but a national uh, project. Uh, I'm, I come to it as the director of Bringing Theory to Practice, which is a national initiative that, that works for uh, transformative uh, in innovation in undergraduate education grounded in what we see as the core purposes of undergraduate education. So active learning, democratic citizenship, the well-being of the whole student, meaningful preparation for work and, and uh, equity so that all students have access to this. And the project, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a minute, is, is our most ambitious effort. I like to say that Bringing theory to practice is radical in both the sense of being transformational uh, and being rooted in what we see as core values. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, and so with that context of bringing theory to practice, what does the Paradigm Project hope to do and what does it look like now? So to, to put it at its most um, unbelievably grandiose, we wanna help catalyze systemic change in undergraduate education uh, that overcomes in a moment of crisis and turmoil uh, uh, and, and helps to helps to create more holistic, more engaged, more equitable undergraduate education um, and to help to create institutions that are themselves more holistic, engaged uh, and equitable. Uh, the um, it's a response to the situation that I think we are all in, 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 in higher ed, uh, that I would define through four assumptions. The first is that we've been living through an existential crisis in a, um, an era of turmoil in higher education, especially undergraduate uh, education. 
the emergencies of the past two years uh, amplified those. They, they brought to a boil crises that had been simmering for a long time uh, in completion, in faculty precarity, uh, in financial crisis, uh, in a loss of confidence in public trust in higher education. Um, that's the first assumption, that we we're in a crisis and that we're at an inflection point of change. The second one is that that's the same years of turmoil have been years of creativity in higher education, often oh, unremarked, and everything from the development of high impact practices and new forms of student support, a growing commitment to racial equity and to student well being. Uh, the third assumption is that while the, that creativity has been remarkable, it's also been piecemeal and fragmented, um, trapped in silos of old paradigms. So that, for instance, folks who are working on racial ec and class equity find it hard to connect with folks who are in uh, new forms of pedagogy or curriculum design or new models of the faculty. Uh, uh, and and the, the, the last assumption is that while we're in a moment of inf uh, an inflection point of change because of all this, it's still undetermined. The, in the next 20 years, higher ed outside of elite institutions will look very different, but that story is still undetermined and, and it's on us to help make a big and positive change uh, instead of being changed. And we, we partly need to do that by bringing these fragmented piecemeal wells of creative energy together, not, not just by adding them up as like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle, but using that creative work to develop new paradigms about the student experience and new ways of organizing academic uh, uh, institutions. That's the kind of framing, the, the underlying assumptions of this project. Um, the project itself, uh, and uh, this is this will, what the next year will very much be about, braids together three different kinds of activities that we see as necessary to make that big positive change that we're aiming for. The first is integrative design. How do we bring together all these different pieces of creative energy, have them be connected and have them create new holes that are greater than the sum of those innovative parts. Um, but innovative design, best practices, new programmatic innovation is necessary, but not sufficient. It's, it's what academics have been doing well for the past 20 years. We also need to do movement building to create a movement across higher ed that enlists faculty, staff, but also students, public allies, administrators in this holistic vision uh, of change and the creation of new kinds of models and, and advocacy and and communities, advocacy, advocacy networks and communities of practice that spread these ideas and advocate for them. That's the second brand, the second strand of this bridge. And then the third uh, strand is shifting the public narrative about the purposes of higher education. That, that narrative has gotten shrunk uh, in recent decades. It's now focused only on credentials and job training. Yes. It's important, but insufficient for what a great education that serves all students should be. And, and until we shift that public narrative, even the best innovation and improvement work will still be stuck in old models. So the project is about braiding together that kind of transformative integrative design with building a movement, with trying to change uh, the public narrative. Um, I, that's a very abstract description and I'm happy to get into the details of it with with you and with folks and to hear their questions but that's that's it in a nutshell well excellent that's a that's a terrific top level outline uh and there's a lot in what you just said of course uh so uh, i think for this group here in rochester describing a movement to accomplish a major change across higher education i think resonates with people who are thinking about open projects and open work in the academy and beyond so for those of you who are here face to face, I'd like you to think about questions that might come specifically from the open work side, as well as questions of tell us more about how this actually works. Uh, I, I have a few more questions, but I'm just gonna ask one and then my job is to get out of the way and open the floor to everybody else for questions. Uh, so 
one of them is just materially right now, what does paradigm look like? How many folks are involved? And you know, do you have a storefront? Do you have a Instagram account? I mean, what, what, what does this look like materially so far? I will answer that, but I noted in the chat, Brian, that there might be some feedback coming from me. Do we need to worry about that right this second? Yeah, is it, for those of you in the audience, both virtual and physical, is this better now? It seems to be better. Okay, okay. I just did a little jiggery pokery on my end and I think that took care of it. Thank you for uh, checking out the chat. Uh, so um, bringing theory to practice is a small, nimble uh, project. We have a core staff of of four soon to go up to five or six with this project. I sometimes call us a, a, a guerrilla rump caucus for change uh, in higher ed. Um, but we are at the center of a lot of alliances and partnerships. Uh, we've worked for many years with organizations supporting civic engagement and student well being and, uh, and integrative learning. And events like this are efforts to build out the, those networks of change even more. So one way of understanding who we are is as a hub that's trying to build a larger set of networks and communities of practice uh, for change. We're based at Elon University, but we're, we're public facing, we're, uh, we're national facing. And the coming year and this year's activities uh, um, have launched each of those three grades of activity that uh, that I talked about. So we have brought together uh, a kind of brain trust of key innovators and thought leaders that we call the Paradigm Working Group. Um, uh, full disclosure, Brian Alexander is one member of that Paradigm Working Group. Yeah, but I'm a quiet one. Um, we, uh, we are starting to harvest and planning to have a set of communication series that lift up really important stories about generative innovation across higher ed, new ways of supporting working class uh, and, and first gen students, uh, new curricular innovations, um, curriculum based on wicked problems, new forms of support for student well-being. Part of what we think it's important to do is in our, in our web platforms, uh, in our uh, bi-weekly letter, uh, in a podcast that we do, is to make sure that folks see what is happening that are seedlings uh, of change. Because right now, higher ed is like a gigantic version of that story of the elephant where everyone touches a different part of it but doesn't understand the whole. Um, we are also launching a series of what we're called emerging models, uh, kind of betas of holistic transformation. Some of them standalone institutions, some of them clusters of partnering institutions. We also see, so, also see those as hubs of movement building uh, and network building. So a lot of a, a lot has been launched at the beginning of what, what has to be uh, a long game of of building change and building relationships and and alliances with a shared vision of change grounded in these core purposes. And by long game, you said the initial plan is a seven year one. The initial plan is a seven year one. We have financial support for the first half of that and are, and are um, seeking resources for the rest of it. Uh, even if, if we are at our most successful, um, this is an even longer project of building new models and new paradigms, not one size fits all models to be replicated, but networks of institutions and, and, and associations and change makers in dialogue with each other building more holistic, less siloed, less instrumentalized forms of education. Excellent. That's a very, very rich answer to my uh, poking question. Um, now I'd like to turn this over to uh, the audience, both the audience face-to-face -face here as well as the audience online. And we have a couple of questions that have come in. A uh, quick clarifying question comes from uh, uh, Mel Chua, who asks, um, is this uh, is the goal to reform undergraduate education broadly or within specific discipline? No, it's the goal is systemic change across uh, undergraduate education. I'm so glad you asked that because part of our vision, part of our assumption is that these values of holistic, socially engaged, in intellectually engaging, um, it, uh, support for the whole person uh, education is as true for the community college students studying in the health 
professions as it is uh, for the person majoring in a career-oriented baccalaureate field or in a traditional liberal arts field. Um, this is really a, vi a holistic vision of undergraduate education itself. And I should also say that on the other hand, there are a lot of issues in higher education that we are not taking on. We're not looking at graduate education. We're not looking at student debt and financing. Um, all We're not looking at faculty research uh, issues, all of which are ab absolutely key. But we often find that when that work is being done by others, that the black box of what we want college and undergraduate education to be gets left out. That's, that's what we're, where our North Star is. Well, thank you for a great answer. And uh, Mel, uh, wherever you are, I can see you. Thank you for that great question. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have come up in the uh, uh, in the question box. I'd like to uh, flash a couple of those up on the screen. Uh, and they come from two great stalwarts of, uh, of the program, people who have been with us for some time, and we're always glad to hear from them. Uh, John Hollenbeck asks, what does success look like? Terms like national conversation don't really mean much. What can or will you do to make a difference? So there's a couple different really great uh, questions in that. First of all, I want to say that um, a term like the public narrative or the national conversation is slippery, but I actually think it means a lot. Um, I think we see its marks in what visions of college and of the future of, of higher education are thinkable or seen as feasible uh, or legitimate. And I, I think that conversation has, uh, which, which gets iterated every time people talk about um, uh, income and job training being the dominant force, or the dominant goal of higher education or the completion agenda being the only important agenda of change. The, these are setting limits on the thinkable uh, in, in higher education. So while, while I think it's a moving target, and I agree with John Hollenbeck that it's hard to pin down. I don't agree with him that it's meaningless or, or without power. I'd say just the opposite. Now, as to what success looks like, that that is really tricky, and it certainly won't happen in seven years. But I would say uh, what would count as success for our project is a public conversation that is richer, that has more, for instance, of the focus on the relationship of education to democracy that, say, the Truman Commission had when it set the national conversation in 1947. So a noticeable, discernible shift in what people think the legitimate questions about the future of higher ed are. Um, a, a, a wealth, a network of exemplary, uh, innovative institutions that are not simply doing great small to medium-sized uh, program building, which is how I would characterize innovation today, but developing interconnected, integrated, holistic forms uh, of change that uh, that that um, that advance the core purposes that I started with, seeing and supporting the, the student as a whole person, uh, preparation for for taking on the problems uh, of the world, active and integrative uh, learning, meaningful preparation for work. So not simply a couple of those, but, but a network of those uh, and active advocacy and change networks taking on what will inevitably be the, the next horizon of problems that those successes uh, have. So there's this is not a closed destination, but there will be important benchmarks of success. Just a quick question from John to follow up on that. He says, how do you control such a thing? I, I'm, don't totally understand the question. Does John mean how do we control the um, the, the dynamic of the project itself? Uh, I think so. I think so. Uh, John, if you want to follow that up uh, in the in the chat, please let me know. Or if you want me to beam me up on stage, I'd be happy to, of course. Uh, so I think um, I think uh, it's in the nature of this kind of change project that is that it's networked and iterative, and I think it's it's one of the. Uh, great strengths of higher education, especially in the U.S., uh, and also one of its great challenges that it, that it does not have a pyramidal structure uh, of control. It's enormously diverse. There are sources of creativity and different models coming from lots of different places. And I think we have lots of, we have lots of examples of where 
networked collaboration and change making have worked. I think of the, the work on student homelessness and hunger mm -hmm. precarity that uh, that the um, Temple Center Hope Center has helped to lead. Uh, networks of activists on, on racial equity. Those aren't controlled, but they have a kind of common commitment to shared collaborative experimentation and, and conversation. And I think that combined with changing the overall public assumptions about higher education is how you guide a change process like this. Oh, thank you. That's a very inspiring answer. And, and John, as always, thank you for a good question. Uh, we have a question just piling up. Uh, sometimes I have to ask and plead and demand questions, but here they're just coming up all over the place. Uh, and this is from our good friend, uh, Sarah San Gregorio, uh, who is uh, always, always a pleasure to see her. I'm amazed that she can make time given all she does. Uh, Sarah, please, uh, she asks, is there contact or a possible partnership with the Department of Education on a state or national level? possible legislation to start making systemic change and possibly get support on that level? Good question. There's a, this is a great question, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's opening up a really complicated set of issues. We've thought hard about where the kind of leverage points for, for change are. Um, state systems are especially important, although we want this change to be intersectoral, not simply to be at the level of, of mm -hmm state university systems. And part of what we're encouraging is collaborations across sectors. But excuse me for that, for that reason. Um, the federal government, to my eye, has not been so interested in what I would call the kind of black box of undergraduate education. They're interested in everything that surrounds that. Uh, um, uh, uh, class and racial disparities, student debt, um, income after college, all important issues. But uh, I think it's hard to get them focused on what exactly do we want the student experience and institutions delivering it uh, to be. The other big change, and I'll come back to state systems in a second. Um, the other big uh, change makers that, that I would point to or leverage points are accreditors. And we've reached out to them and, and want to try and be in a conversation uh, with them, getting them to think about uh, how to how to measure and support and nudge forward these visions of, of holistic, engaged, uh, equitable uh, education. State systems um, are uh, have the, the the strengths and the weaknesses of being big bureaucratic systems, and um, they do a good job of paying attention to certain kinds of outcomes. But don't always ask what what are the underlying purposes for which those outcomes are benchmarked. Mm. Uh, and one of the things we want to bring to that conversation uh, is that learning outcomes and graduate graduation outcomes, completion attainment outcomes are important, but as benchmarks of these underlying purposes. This language of purposes, I think, is really important to renewing undergraduate uh, education and. and we want to engage at least some state systems uh, in that. And that also brings us back to the national conversation, I think. Um, for, we have more online questions, um, and um, but I want to make sure that the face-to-face -face audience here feels like they can, they can add. We have at least one mic, and if uh, no one volunteers, I'll probably throw it. So you got to, someone better volunteer before it becomes too dangerous. Also, if you don't want to speak on the mic, you can just stand up and holler at me. And I'll repeat it out loud in just in case of people that couldn't hear you. Again, this is this is a forum for everybody's questions. So you can ask a technical question about funding, for example, or how many points of control there'll be in a network, or you can ask broader questions about strategy, practice, and even, as uh, David just said, the very purpose of this. So anybody here in the face-to-face -face crowd want to ask a question, especially from the open source side? Is that a, is that a question from the John Federer lookalike? All right. Well, they're being. Oh no, we have one from our wonderful host. And, well, we should belong in many ways. So we're we're having a very dramatic walk to the podium um, by our wonderful host, Stephen. So, yes. So the the folks who are here on this side of the, uh, the audience, uh, I see in here. Can you hear me? Uh, 
Yes, no. I'm, I'm, I can I can hear you okay, but I may ask uh, Brian to to clarify at the end of your question. I can hear myself, and I'm talking a lot of how is it now. So, you know, uh, across this, the ideas of the, the use of open educational resources, the use of the, the use of open access journals, the the way in which your movement might align with work outside of traditional measures of tenure and promotion to, to push your vision forward and thought through those things or how might they impact what you're, you're talking about. Brian, I caught most of it, but can you repeat for me? Sure. Uh, so the question is based on uh, some of the experience we've had with open access and scholarly publication, as well as uh, open source software development in universities. You know, what can what can we learn from all of that to help this movement grow, uh, especially in terms of tenure promotion or review? Stephen, did I do okay? Yeah. So um, there are, um, I hear two levels in that question uh, that are really important. The, the, the level at the very end about tenure and promotion also resonates with my own experience in the civic and community engagement movement where creating protocols and norms and practices to support faculty public scholarship in, in tenure and promotion has also been uh, a complicated challenge. I'll, I'll say that I think underlying all three of those examples, the uh, open source uh, and open-based research, uh, public scholarship, and the work we're doing uh, is a challenge to regular protocols of the faculty role based on disciplinary professionalism and, and the traditional disciplines that is that is a challenge both to faculty themselves to create new practices um, and to the institutions to reward uh, those those new practices um, so there's there's a there's a an ant, there's a parallel that I hear to how much to what I know about the open source discussion in terms of faculty uh, rewards, where you need to to enlist faculty in uh, in commitment to a new set of roles and practices, whether it's um, uh, open source research uh, or um, attention to, to uh, the pedagogy of of the whole student and the well being of the student to take one challenging issue in the work that we're doing. Um, and not have faculty resistance to that and not have institutional uh, resistance to it. So that's, so it seems to me there's quite an analogy there. And we're just at, at the beginning of a process where some faculty hear about this project and like literally email me, I'm all in how I can help. And, and others say, why should I buy into this? Why should I trust the administration? Kind of, a kind of hunkering down uh, response. I think change is happening in undergraduate education, big change, especially outside of a small group of elite institutions. And, and I think it will be, it's not a question of getting institutions and faculty to, um, to make a choice between a steady state and a risky change. The change is going to come and it's just, and it's, and, and whether, whether that is change that happens to us or we help to shape that involves new new visions of the faculty role of, of faculty rewards and uh, and and uh, uh, and promotion. Um, more general, the second level of the question, which was about um, lessons to be learned from the work that's happening in the audience for our work. That's a great question, and I only have first instincts about it. It's really important. This is this is a community organizing project, a project of bringing people together in new relationships to work for change outside of their accustomed institutions or, or areas of work. So a commitment to open flow of ideas and information will be is essential uh, to that and to our, our lifting up these stories of change. At the same time, institutions are very careful about how they want their stories to be told, uh, especially when you want to learn from their mistakes as well as their uh, innovative strengths. So I think I think we will have to develop a set of practices that enlists institutions in opening up their work 
uh, to a, a broader conversation. Um, and I think we have things to learn from, from the open source movement, um, but we'll need to translate that. Well, thank you. Uh, again, thank you, Stephen, for the excellent, rich question. Um, and just you know, one note that's been occurring, David, uh, through the past few days here is that uh, a key aspect of any open project or open work is human engineering, uh, getting, uh, getting people to work together and how complex, uh, challenging and rewarding that is. Uh, we have more questions here. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask. And uh, you mentioned the whole person. Uh, we have a question from Leslie Harris on specifically that point. Um, let's see, Leslie asks, let me bring it up on the stage. Support for the whole person is a typical philosophy for Jesuit institutions. Are you drawing from that thought tradition? Very much so. Um, I, have, I have two thoughts about that. First is absolutely, you nailed it. Um, we're we're working with several Jesuit and faith-based institutions. Although, and in that case, the Jesuit idea of cura personalis has been very helpful for those of you who know that. There are also other traditions outside of faith-based education that that give important language about that. Um, but the other thing I would say is I, I've also there's a there's a part of my mind that that is wary of 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 overly fetishizing or investing in the idea of the whole person because it seems to me um, none of us no matter how well formed or adult or on, on our journey we are, uh, are are truly whole in that sense we we are aspirational uh, and we want we want students to to be in that sometimes uncomfortable place of of, of, of being uh, on their journey and and the language of the whole, we want the language of the whole person, I think, to be a way of seeing the student in all of her, is their complexities, not a kind of vision of whom we want them to become as a finished project, product. Great question, then. And, and David, thank you for that answer. I'm glad to hear that in play. Uh, Look in the chat, uh, our good friend Roxanne Riskin shared a good link to uh, the Cura Personalis uh, pedagogy. Thank so you. Uh, and now, since we're showing off all kinds of ways that we make this forum work, let me uh, bring on stage for a video question, our good friend and several times guest, uh, Tom Ames. So let me just bring him on stage. And hello, Tom, in the blue room. Hey, I'm wearing a green shirt, though. So, hey, David, good to see you again. Good to see you, Tom. Um, so my question is, you mentioned the elephant before and, and, and not seeing the elephant, seeing the pieces of the elephant. And the question I had was, you know, which way do you see things? Is the elephant uh, walking backwards or forwards? Um, and, uh, you know, how much panic are you detecting in institutions, especially around things like enrollment declines? Uh, and how is that driving change? I mean, there's there's two ways to respond to challenge. One is to bunker down, and and go back to well, this worked in the past. We might we need to go back to that, or this is an opportunity for self reflection and, and forward momentum. So, which what are you seeing? What, what's your sense of that? So, I think let me um, let me tweak your image. I think there are three ways of responding. I would say. Um, two of them forward moving and one backward or one hunkering down. I th as I said before, I think the hunkering down won't work unless you are truly a well-resourced institution uh, uh, or field that can protect yourself from, from the winds of change. And, and even if I were in an institution like that, I wouldn't want to be mm -hmm. you know, betting on my capacity to survive other people's downwards spiral. But I think um, the the elephant uh, is can move forward, or it, it, um, let me take it out of the elephant metaphor. Um, uh, there there are really terrible ways forward, in my view, uh, that are systemic. They see education whole, but they are building a whole that I think uh, uh, is is one to be lamented. Uh, the, the idea of very transactional, instrumentalized, mm -hmm. uh, what I would call instrumental vocationalism, which I would distinguish from education for work in, in a meaningful way. That's a way forward. Uh, and, and systemic change can produce that. And there, there are many forces 
heading us towards that future. We are trying to build uh, an alternative way forward. And I actually see that struggle as the main struggle. It's not, it's not the choice of hunkering down or moving forward. It's which way forward is going to be more powerful. And um, the one we're advocating for, you ask if there's panic, is, um, is def does, does def I'm not advocating for panic, yeah. but. <laughs> uh, right. I'm the, yeah. the, um, the, one, the one we are advocating for um, is uh, uh, right now <laughs> does not have the, uh, the, the array of forces uh, on our side, but that's partly because folks who I think are committed to this, these values have, been, have had their heads down, have been fragmented, or think they can just last out these, these, uh, the storms of change. And part of the reason why we're focusing on movement building is we think among students and among faculty and staff educators, there's an enormous reservoir of commitment to some version or another of these values, not, not right. and we want to catalyze that. I've got, a, I've got a term for your negative outcome, um, in stage educational capitalism. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's a great phrase. End stage educational capitalism. That's a great phrase to conjure with, Tom. Transactional. I mean, I, I call it transactional teaching uh, at a lower level and that my students just, you know, they want the grade. They paid for it. Right. You know? But I will, if I could just piggyback yeah. on one more thought yeah. about that is um, there's a view of, uh, that I hear a lot in the, in the conversations about this project that all students want is the grade and the job, and and students are rightfully worried about their future. There's so much precarity, right. but I think they 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 are also they want to be, for lack of a better word, civic actors in taking on the economic crisis, the climate crisis. They are cynical about politics because they believe in the promise of politics, and so they're. I, I think they they are underserved by. Uh, mm -hmm. To get back to John's challenge to me, the mm -hmm. national conversation that's maybe not universally, but largely focused on on immediate job training and the payoff for credentials. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, as someone who teaches politics and tries to ground that to my students, uh, I say, look, you know, I'm teaching you the skills to navigate politics. That's what you need. Not you don't need to memorize a bunch of stuff you can Google on about how many people are in Congress or something like that. But what you do need to be able to do is synthesize information, communicate information. Oh, by the way, this works for you outside of politics and political discourse as well. Very useful as an employee. Um, but that's that's a very different, and they, they uh, it takes a lot of, I'm going through the adjustment period with them right now at the beginning of the semester, because they're like, what do you mean there's no tests, you know, and that sort of thing. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a real challenge. And, and um, one of the things that I've been working on is trying to, f I, I, is developing these really fluid models of, you know, I think the pandemic should teach us that, that we, we don't have to drive everybody to class twice a week from 930 to 11. You know, that's for a lot of reasons is not an efficient way of necessarily learning uh, and learning on cue, you know, how can we leverage all of these technologies and blend things together in a completely different creative way than the way we've been doing, you know, and but that's deeply threatening at some level to some of these structures uh, that we built up, you know, but yeah, we'll keep up with the good fight. And uh, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm also getting bashed by windmills on a regular basis. So. Not that. <laughs> Join us, Tom Haynes, we need you. <laughs> well, okay. Indeed. Thank you, Tom Quixote Haynes. And, uh, so if, if, you're, if you're new to the forum, those are examples of questions that come from uh, video, as well as from the Q&A box, uh, as well as from the chat. Uh, so we uh, stand open and ready for more of your questions and comments. And of course, we're welcome to all of them. Again, if you want to be as basic and or technical as you like, or as theoretical or strategic as you like, uh, we're happy to hear from you. Yeah, uh, I don't know where the microphone went. There it is, and you've got it. Um, what that comes up, Kendall Horton. Um, one of the questions that came to my head is: COVID rapidly forced educational systems to change, 
and teach us to learn new methods of how to work. What lessons do you think can be taken from that and that process to what you're trying to do? What lessons do we take from the response to COVID for, for what we're trying to do? Yeah, for how teachers had to adjust to teaching during COVID to that point. So I would say um, one lesson is to dispel the canard that higher ed is stuck and incapable of nimble change. Uh, I think that one should be put to bed uh, for, for good. Uh, we don't need some kind of external Archimedean disruptor, we need to kind of bring to critical mass the capacities for for change that, that are in higher ed and in our public uh, allies. Um, the, I'd say the second lesson uh, is we responded in a way that's quite um, uh, impressive to the emergency of COVID with remote teaching and a range of other things. Unevenly, some places did better than others, but on the whole, I'm impressed with it. But emergency management is not the same thing as change. Um, and I and I think um, we, we need to step back. So I don't think the story is, for instance, now we, now, uh, we learned that remote education is good and can move forward with that. I think, um, I think all the questions about what makes um, online education good or bad are still being explored and, and I'm happy to speak to my views on that. But I think the third lesson, which in some ways may be the most important one, is that education cannot proceed on the part of either students or faculty under conditions where the well-being of the person is not being supported. Um, mm -hmm. Faculty discovered that that what they might have thought of as this palaver about student well-being applied to them uh, under their conditions of, of stress uh, and anxiety and isolation. And they saw a lot, they got a lot of teaching from students about how important it was to adjust teaching practices so that students, without which students cannot learn. Um, so I think it, it put well-being and the connection between mind, body, and heart on the agenda as, as now as something that had been pretty pretty well um, uh, under attended to, especially by faculty uh, before the before the pandemic. And there's a really important opportunity to learn from that shift in consciousness. Uh, thank you for the great question, um, and uh, and David, thank you for the really really thoughtful answer. Um, we have uh, another question or a comment that came up in the chat from our good friend, Carolyn Coward, who, by the way, has a great job. She's a librarian at, at uh, Jet Propulsion Labs, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and Carolyn says that the, some of what you say, David, reminds her of what people say about library. Uh, stuck in the past, in need of modernization, slow to change unless there's a, a, a catastrophe. And I'm, I'm curious, what do you see as the role of uh, academic and or public libraries in the Paradigm Project. So shout out to Carolyn Coward, uh, with whom uh, we've been in contact uh, with Bring Theory to Practices work in the past. That's a great question. I, I want to answer it, first of all, by saying we spent about a year in the, the staff of Bring Theory to Practice thinking for ourselves what would it mean to try and make what big systemic change rather than what we felt was the medium-sized change that we had been doing just fine with. And one of the uh, examples we researched uh, was the transformation of public libraries. Because to our eyes as outsiders, the shift in the public library from the place where you got books to uh, the community building, multimodal, multimedia center that, that at least the many public libraries today exemplify, with a, in a much smaller way, a smaller institution, showed us some of the things that had to change uh, uh, for higher ed. My, my sense is that the American Library Association and other allies have helped catalyze the kind analogous changes uh, to the ones that, uh, that, that we are thinking of. On the question of what, and, and I think we need to keep learning, um, uh, keep learning from that. To the extent that libraries 
shifted from being highly specialized and functionally siloed spaces to spaces that brought to, that were hubs of different kinds of relationships and, and different kinds of, of human development um, from community, from kids learning to skill building to um, filling out your tax forms to community debates. Um, that shift towards integrated intersectional roles and relationships is something we can learn from. I'm, I may be over romanticizing the success of the library and Caroline can correct me, but that's how I think about it. Well, and Carolyn, please feel free to uh, add either a question or a comment in the chat box or to join us on stage. Um, I often like to point to the transformation of the library world by saying, you know, you think about the library as giving up the card catalog and then creating, you know, the wonderful Marx standard. There's nothing quite like that in almost anywhere else in academia. But I, I, I do have to push back, I think, David, on, on one point, which is that the American Library Association played a key role in that. But the ALA is a gigantic and almost total organization. Uh, we don't have anything like that for uh, under the faculty who teach undergraduate uh, students. Um, is I mean, is, is the Paradigm Project kind of trying to do that in a more network-oriented way? So uh, um, I'll say, again, this is as an outsider that did some research on the libraries. You're totally, you're right that the ALA is positioned in a way that not even the accreditors or uh, are in this very distributed landscape of higher ed. There were also organizations that I would describe as guerrilla rump caucuses in the library world that are more analogous to what we were trying to do, that were bringing people together and, and um, catalyzing um, uh, different kinds of, of experiments. That, that's, that's the work that I think we can do. Uh, but you may be right that uh, there's, there's simply no point of leverage is effective the way that the ALA was in, in the evolution of the public library. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, and Carolyn jumps in by saying that what saying that what libraries did was analyze patron needs, uh, librarian skill set, and the intersection between the two. Uh, so, in a sense, that's similar to what you're talking about of uh, changing student needs, changing students, as well as what faculty can offer them. I think. And Chris Borg disagreed with me that the ALA was a was a positive or said he doesn't know many librarians who agree with that. Uh, I'll defer to more expert folks on this. Chris, do you want to? OK, OK. Um, we have uh, only a couple more minutes left, and I want to make sure that everybody who has a question uh, gets a chance to put it to us. So if there's anybody here in Rochester or if there's anybody in the shindig space who would like to put up a question, either just face-to-face, uh, -face, raise your hand, and we'll throw you a mic. Uh, or use the uh, chat box or the question box or click the raise hand button to do it virtually. Uh, I have one question, David, that, that I, I, I have to put as the, as the room's futurist here. If this succeeds, uh, if, if the Paradigm Project manages to help build a network uh, of, of faculty who are interested in reforming undergraduate education, if that spreads and grows, uh, that the national narrative changes, um, what does higher education look like? in say five or six years? How does it look different from what it is now? So uh, um, I think uh, we, we see not only important new models, but public and, and cross higher ed attention being paid to those models. Uh, and there, there are lots of them out there. I mean, the. Um, to, to pull some random examples, uh, Dominican University in California has created this um, very impressive initiative called the Dominican Experience that integrates what they call integrative coaching with signature work uh, and community engagement. Uh, the uh, Rutgers University Newark um, Honors Living Learning Community is a new kind of honors program aimed at uh, Newark kids and adults um, that combines a deep communal welcoming experience for students who come to college without a lot of the educational capital of other students and community engagement um, and skill building. And it's transformational not only for the students, but also for the, the retention and, and, and graduation uh, rates. James Madison University is ha has uh, an, an extraordinary design thinking driven 
set of curricular innovations, one thread of which is called the X Labs, but they're not trying to, to generalize it um, in larger chunks of the curricular experience. So interdisciplinary, wicked problem-based mm -hmm. curricula. Plymouth State has, has a similar uh, initiative. Um, if you're kind of paying attention to the innovation game, you know about these things, but, and they're very powerful, uh, and there are dozens of them, um, and they don't talk to each other yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and the public conversation about higher education, outside of the occasional article in the Heckinger Report, Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't lift them up. So connecting them, amplifying them, learning from them is is key. Um, right, doing work like this, and thank you, Brian, for providing the forum, uh, or in Change Magazine, where I'll be publishing uh, an essay, or on the op-ed pages of The Atlantic or The Washington Post, mm -hmm. uh, where many, where the folks involved in this program or in this project are starting to work starting to, to kind of shift the public assumptions that legitimize educational decision makers investing in the kinds of changes that, that this would bring. Um, those are some of the key ways that I would hope higher ed and decision makers in higher ed would, would see things differently. Well, if, if, if I could, if I could take that great vision, and I, I, I want to throw it out to the uh, both the physical and the virtual audiences and ask, well, what can we learn from either social movements or from open source and open work successes to help this succeed? Uh, that sense of, for example, finding pockets of innovation and lifting them up and reflecting them so people can hear about them and connecting them, uh, being able to share uh, excellent uh, uh, practices and ideas. And what, what lessons can we learn that we can apply here? I'm curious of people who've worked in open software or who have worked in project development, as well as people who have worked on any attempt to transform anything from uh, a computing platform to a society. Any practices or tips? Yeah, please. Thank you. So one of the, the big innovations, at least for me, when I was teaching was the ability to fork other practitioners' repos both in an academic context and in a corporate context and work off of other people's policies. Um, in the government space where I am now, uh, it's really common for one agency to fork a successful open source policy and sort of pick up where the other has left off. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that idea of forking and building upon previous versions of policy is very normal in software and it's not as common as in the academic space. Interesting. And we don't have anything like GitHub where you can point to and say, well, there's the original, and here's my fork of it. Um, could you all hear that? I think you all heard that all right. And, and tell us your name again, please. Oh, <laughs> you can just shout. Uh, Remy Nikosik, I'm at the Digital Services at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Thank you. Thank you. So that's a great idea to be able to have uh, a given, in this case, a given pedagogy or practice. Were you lunging for the mic? Lunging for the mic. Please, please, Thank go you. ahead. Um, Thank you. Thanks, hi. Um, so I'm, I'm Carson Wade, have a community architect from Red Hat. Um, and what I, I wanted to, to some degree, uh, really reaffirm the, the aspect of, of the program that you were last describing, the program that you were last describing, how the, the focus on, on, on people who are, the, the focusing the agenda on people who are um, you know, not represented in the organizations or the areas you are. So one, um, for, for a long time, for example, in open source, we talked about the lowering barriers to entry is a way to make sure that when people came along, they were able to find a good path to be a participant, being friendly and welcoming to people and so forth. But when you get down to it, what we're talking about is accessibility, right? I mean, every conversation in open source ends up coming down to a question of, of inclusion, accessibility, and then ultimately equity. And so by those, there's some big intersection places between the work that you just described in the future and the work and what's going on in open source at the same time. So making cross connections and, and they're things like all in open source, that are doing that, they're looking to to open source diversity and inclusion by working with students who, who don't have that um, educational background. And, um, and I, I, I forget the words that you used, but I know exactly what you meant. That, that sense of, oh, there's a lot of things that have to come together in that honors program to to to, uh, to give people that, that culture experience and the teaching prospect. So those things are kind of happening and being able to share those with everybody and each other um, and the practices of what we're doing in the stories that will probably be really helpful. 
Well, thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you very, very much for that. I appreciate that. So we've got advice from, uh, from Red Hat on how to do equity and the importance of that. Um, and also uh, importance from software developing about forking. But unfortunately, we have just run out of time. Uh, we have come to the top of the hour. Um, and uh, I, have to, I have to say, first of all, uh, David, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing so much of this. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen is a link to the PDF of the project description that people can find and read right now if you like. Um, how else can people keep up with this, David, or participate? So uh, um, two, two or three immediate ways. First of all, I, I, I dropped my uh, uh, email and my colleague, Paul Shadowald, senior project manager, in the chat. <clears throat> we would love to hear from you. Uh, we would love to know your thoughts about this project. We would love to know what you are doing or your institution is doing uh, that you think connects with uh, this project or that would be that our work would be enriched by. And if you're interested in building out these kinds of networks of folks with shared values who want to join, uh, do advocacy work, we especially wanted uh, to know that. The most immediate way you can keep on hearing from us is by going to the Bringing Theory to Practice uh, website, bttop.org. And at the bottom of the landing page, signing up for our bi-weekly letter, which is called Bringing It, uh, yeah. which, uh, which will keep you connected to our work and where we will start to publish some of these key stories about kind of generative positive work that's happening across higher ed. Well, excellent. Uh Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you for everybody for participating in this experiment of having uh, kind of a two level synthetic meeting of face to face and virtual together. Um, we, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And with this, I will hit the recording stop and post this up to YouTube so uh, you can have access to it later on. David, thank you for leading this project. Uh, it's so very exciting. Good luck. Brian, thank you for, for letting us for letting us talk about it. And thanks to the whole audience for your interest and, and all of the questions and thoughts and comments. Happy to, happy to. Um, if you'd like to keep talking about this, uh, we can talk on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag FTTE, uh, or you can at me at Brian Alexander or grab my blog at brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to look into the past for some previous sessions on these topics, uh, tinyurl.com slash FTF archive will take you back to more than 300 sessions. Uh, if you would uh, like to look at our sessions coming up, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us. Um, and if you would like to, among other things, expect my good wishes uh, or accept my good wishes and good luck for this fall semester. Uh, it's a very, very challenging time. And I'm glad to do this in combination with so many of you. Uh, in the meantime, take care, everybody. Be safe, and we'll see you online. Bye-bye.